Okay, so uh, before I get started, uh, I just want to tell you about an interesting question that uh, was asked of me at the end of the lecture this morning about these models for heating uh, giant planets to keep them inflated. And the question was whether the ohmic dissipation model, which is one in which um, essentially you get uh, currents generated within the, the interior of these giant planets and that that uh, essentially provides the heating ultimately driven by uh, the parent star. Whether that could actually inflate a, a cold Jupiter or whether one required that the thing be hot. And uh, I did check actually, and I couldn't find the paper, but I checked the presentation that I have on this. And um, you have to start with a hot Jupiter. Uh, it has to be inflated. So. An interesting potential observation for these hot Jupiters uh, and the mechanisms that keep them inflated uh, would be anything that would show that they started out cold or that they moved in, uh, they migrated in rather late in um, the history of their, their particular planetary system. Because to start out with a body that's uh, inflated and, and hot, you have to move it in, you have to migrate it in quite early in its history. Uh, and so uh, we're talking about, you know, the first few million years. So that's an interesting constraint. Um, okay, so when your beautiful strategy is about to be demolished, always wear a tie. Uh, and um, in this case, we talked about uh, the strategy from uh, the Exoplanet Task Force this morning, which was essentially um, to do some key things prior to uh, even thinking about launching uh, a large expensive device to uh, take spectra of Earth-sized planets around sun-like stars that might be 10 parsecs away, for example. Uh, that, of course, was technology development, determine the frequency of Earth-sized planets in or near the habitable zone, and also to get the addresses and masses of candidates that you want to make spectra of. And that last step is the most expensive. It requires a space-based astrometry mission that could uh, look at the nearest 60 to 100 stars in the solar neighborhood, uh, search for Earth-sized planets. That requires sub-micro arc second uh, accuracy, 0.1 micro arc second accuracy, and that's many orders of magnitude better than the Gaia mission that's being readied. Um, and, um, you know, it, in and of itself it's a significant mission, but it's one that, that NASA has invested a lot of money in, uh, in terms of technology studies, and was called Space Interferometry Mission. And of course, as I argued this morning, getting the mass of a planet is really getting a fundamental parameter. So we did our work, uh, we published the report, we got our medals of something or other, uh, and um, <clears throat> then uh, along came the uh, Decadal Survey for Astronomy and Astrophysics. Every 10 years in the United States, the National Academy of Sciences uh, organizes a very elaborate, increasingly elaborate uh, study of what should be done in astronomy in the following decade. And these reports, of which I think this is the fifth, have become very influential. They're regarded quite highly, and uh, they have a lot of influence. So the bottom line is, if you have a big mission, and your mission is not in the decadal survey for that decade, uh, you should probably take a break for about a decade. Um, now, this is not planetary exploration. Planetary exploration got started late, and there is actually now a decadal survey for solar system exploration. In fact, the second one of those has just been released. But this is the Astronomy and Astrophysics Decadal Survey. It's a beautifully bound book. Don't buy it. You can download the contents for free from the website. Um, but um, to make a long story short, and I'll Full disclosure, say that I was on the committee. Uh, I did feel a little bit lonely. Um, but uh, the committee did not endorse space interferometry mission. Uh, in fact, it wasn't even close, although I'm not supposed to say that. Um, so space interferometry mission was gone and is gone. And uh, even in Europe, there was a, a mission uh, slightly less ambitious called NEAT, N-E-A-T, and I can't remember the acronym for that 
which was proposed uh, as an M-class candidate mission in the last go-around. And uh, even that was not selected in favor of a mission that will make transit observations. So evidently, the, the notion of launching something to get masses uh, without taking pictures doesn't have a lot of cachet. And that's just the way it is. So where does that actually leave us? Well, it leaves us if you rebuild the strategy pretty much with something like this. And here's my son calling, but I can't actually take the call. Um, okay. Um, say la vie. All right, I'll talk to him later. So the wonders of having everything on the one laptop, right? You wonder what other things are gonna pop up shortly. So here's the strategy. And uh, the M-Dwarf part of the strategy is not affected. It's affected by something else, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, and that is the delays to JWST. But uh, one can still, and, and I should say now that here I'm, I'm freewheeling. We have not reconvened the Exoplanet Task Force. Uh, I've talked to some individual members here and there where I needed some help on radial velocity and other things, but our, our committee's disbanded. So, <clears throat> this is my own personal addendum. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, we need to continue uh, uh, absorbing the implications of the results of Corot and Kepler, the transit missions. Uh, we need to continue absorbing the results of radial velocity and whatever ground-based microlensing uh, discoveries are made. Uh, technology development uh, needs to continue and, and we need to find some way to organize a survey of nearby stars for uh, determining the distribution of dust emission from those systems. Something which is, is not easy to do, but it's feasible. And it's a ground-based program. It's not a particularly <coughs> high-profile program. It's a little bit difficult to get money to use very large telescopes, uh, particularly the large binocular telescope, uh, the LBT, would be optimized to this. It's hard to get money to use these telescopes to look at dust, especially when that dust is um, the noise and not the signal. Uh, but that needs to be done. But in the six to 10 year time frame now, things are very different. And again, this is the case where Aetis of Earth might turn out to be greater than 0.1 and the exozotes turn out to be fairly reasonable so that the end state is a space-based direct imaging mission. But in the middle, uh, we still really need masses. And I think the other uh, point that uh, I will get to a little bit later is that even with Corot and Kepler, we may not really get an accurate determination of Aetis of Earth within the habitable zone. Um, he'll just have to keep calling, I guess. There we go, sorry, ma'am. Um, the next time he calls, I'll answer it and tell him I'm lecturing. How's that? Okay. So. We need to uh, get these masses, and we need to have um, a good understanding of the abundance of planets, uh, Earth-sized planets, in the 1 to 10 astronomical unit region. Now, I'll talk about high-precision RV in a moment. This is just a name. Uh, the microlensing would have to be done by a microlensing space-based mission uh, that would uh, replace the need for uh, a network of observatories on the Earth with a single spacecraft that would basically stare at the galactic bulge. And in fact, this mission was the highest priority mission in the decadal survey, but it's not microlensing planet finder, it's something called WFIRST, which really came out of a dark energy mission called JDEM but a sub-panel of the decadal survey figured out that you might be able to actually do uh, microlensing with a dark energy mission. Now, this was figured out first, of course, here in Europe. Studies uh, of Euclid, which is another dark energy mission, uh, were always of interest to people who wanted to do microlensing. Uh, but at least in that case, uh, Euclid was really first and foremost intended to be a dark energy mission. So. Uh, the microlensing proponents have not gained very much traction uh, in the Euclid uh, arena, at least at the moment. In the case of W first, which is less mature because it's now a new concept, but potentially more ambitious, 
Microlensing is built in from the start as one of the three key goals of the mission, dark energy, microlensing, infrared galactic survey. Um, so this completes uh, with Corot, Kepler, microlensing, radio velocity work. In essence, this really completes, if it's done, uh, a survey, a statistical survey of the <coughs> architectures of planetary systems. We, we will know a lot from these. Um, but at the same time, we won't have the addresses for nearby objects. And a previous decadal survey said one should not do anything like TPF unless you're really sure that there's a planet out there that you can actually image. Well, in order to be really sure, uh, you either have to have statistics that tell you that Eta sub Earth is close to one, or you have to go out and get the addresses of these planets before you spend a significant amount of money to actually design and build a space-based uh, direct imaging and spectroscopy system. This is really direct detection. So this is Terrestrial Planet Finder, uh, or Darwin, uh, which is the more ambitious European version. But more likely, because of the realities of the budget, this is in fact the Terrestrial Planet C, or Coronagraphic Mission, that Jim Casting talked about in his lecture this morning. And what that means is that it's a, a four meter telescope. Oh, okay. A four meter telescope um, with a coronagraph, which would be able to um, make low resolution spectra of Earth sized planets around stars that are within 10 parsecs of the Earth. Um, and in order to use that system, you really have to know that you're going to have enough targets. So, that brings us to high precision radial velocity. Um, now, being a theorist, I can simply take the chart that uh, I think what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm finally just going to yield and I'm going to close my browser, uh, my um, internet here. So, let's see, here we go. Network, there we go, turn airport off. Okay, very good. <laughs> There's just way too much activity here. Okay, that's good. Goodbye. All right. So, as a theorist, what I can simply do to invent high precision radio velocity is I can take the line that you recall this morning on this chart of planet mass sensitivity versus orbit period in years. Uh, here are the here's the astrometry sim light mission, uh, the sensitivity for the farthest star in the sample they selected, the closest star, and the median star. And you see where the Earth is and where Venus is. And again, ignore the green dots in the background. That's just one theoretical model. So here's radial velocity for about a meter per second sensitivity. And in order to event invent high precision radial velocity, I simply move this uh, line appropriate to an accuracy of a tenth of a meter per second, which for a G-type star just barely nicks the Earth and Venus, um, but not quite. You really need six centimeters per second. Uh, but if you decide that you can tolerate a K-dwarf rather than a G-dwarf, you're okay. But how do you do this? Uh, this is the issue. And um, I talked to quite a few experts in radial velocity. And the general consensus is, and please, if this is wrong, everybody stand up and scream right now. The general consensus is that 10 centimeters per second is instrumentally achievable. But there may be only a small number of G dwarfs, if any, sufficiently quiet to take advantage of this capability. Basically, there's a spectrometer, at least one, being built now, Espresso, that can do this. But the issue is that stars themselves have noise <coughs> in the form of surface motions that can both broaden stellar lines and mimic the radial velocity signatures from small planets. And so the challenge is to be able to deal with that noise. Now, depending on which articles you read in the literature, I actually, I also read, I didn't do the Republican approach of just asking people. I actually read some articles, too. Depending upon the... Um, who you, you know, which article you read, um, the, the noise is either um, something that cannot be surmounted even at the level of a meter per second, 
or it's something that can be surmounted at a level of 10 centimeters per second. And basically, you have to understand really well um, the, uh, the periodicities, the cadences of these noise sources. Uh, you have to plan observations that have long enough time baselines that you can basically remove the shorter term uh, variations and be able to deal with any long term variations that might mimic a planet. In short, it's difficult, but it's doable, but it's going to require resources. And it's going to require routinely doing radio velocity studies on, on eight meter telescopes or larger. So um, this really, if, if the strategy that the task force put together has any merit at all, personally I think it does, um, there's going to have to be some investment in this type of activity to replace uh, the space-based astrometry that probably is not going to happen. <clears throat> so anyway, that's the second hat I'm passing around the room after passing around the hat for Titan yesterday. <clears throat> Okay, so what is Eta sub Earth in the habitable zone? Well, we don't know what that is, but one can begin to get values for Eta sub Earth inward of the habitable zone. And this is the preprint that came out a couple of months ago or a month ago by uh, uh, Bill Baruchian and colleagues reporting on this large release of Kepler planetary candidates. Again, these are candidates because the vast majority of them have not been confirmed. Although, um, at least at the moment, the, the um, rate at which false positives have been found uh, is fairly small. I think it's 10%. Um, might be a little bit more than that. So these statistics probably will, will remain okay. Although, obviously, for the smallest sized objects, one's likely to get the highest number of false positives. So what this is, is the number of planetary candidates that they have in their sample. Remember, these are uh, transiting planets, Kepler stairs with a very large format camera at a big chunk of the Cygnus spiral arm of our galaxy and stares at 150,000 stars. And as those stars vary in brightness, that's flagged and one looks to see if these are repeated, that is if they're periodic, and have the, the appearance of a transit essentially. And there's a lot of filtering and other things that go on uh, to lead to um, something being identified as a candidate. So uh, anyway, in, in Bill's paper, uh, this is, um, the planets have been binned into Jupiter size, Neptune size, super Earth size, and Earth size. And if you take 100, this is a back of the, back of the envelope calculation, you take 150,000 stars, and you assume that 1% are going to have uh, transiting planets just on the basis of random orientations <coughs> Uh, of the orbit planes of the systems uh, relative to the Earth. So that gets you down uh, from 150,000 to 1,500. And then uh, you have about 50 Earth-sized candidates, uh, admittedly very close to the parent stars because these are semi-major axes of 0.1 or so. You get an eta sub-Earth, but this is not for the habitable zone, this is for the Kepler zone, of 0.05, of 5%. However, it's quite evident in these graphs that these numbers are falling off with increasing semi-major axis. And there's no evidence from radial velocity or other data that the actual occurrence of planets falls off in that way. This is obviously an observational effect. It's a completeness effect because Kepler hasn't looked long enough to see these longer period orbits. But also, the farther out you get, the 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 uh, smaller the probability that you can actually have a transit and that falls off very steeply. And there again is the issue that really to do this for the habitable zone, the 1AU region, you kind of need microlensing. Now a somewhat um, slightly more pessimistic analysis uh, was submitted as an astro pH by uh, Katanzarite and Shao at JPL and they came up with um, they actually tried to calculate Eta sub Earth within the habitable zone by taking the Kepler data, uh, correcting for the observational effects and so on, extrapolating out to the one astronomical unit region and choosing an appropriate size uh, for the habitable zone. And what they come up with is an Eta sub Earth in the habitable zone, which is really the number that we want, of between one and three percent, okay? 
Now, I call this the nightmare scenario because if eta sub earth were 10 to the minus 4, you could, I mean, it would be easy to say, let's just forget about terrestrial planet finder, forget about even Darwin. Uh, it's very unlikely there's going to be anything within the solar neighborhood to look at. Let's just go spend our lives studying Jupiter and Neptune-sized bodies and, and enjoy ourselves. Um, if Aetis of Earth were a tenth, we'd say, this is great, go for it. They're going to be candidates. They're going to be nearby stars that will have Earth's in the habitable zone. And we should build TPFC and maybe a TPFI, which is the interferometer version, the Darwin concept that uh, Jim showed. We should just go do it. But 0 0.01 is in the middle. I mean, it's too small to get really enthusiastic, and it's not small enough to say, let's forget about this and do something else. Jim. Can I make a comment on it? They used the most conservative estimate of the continuously habitable zone there, mm -hmm. not the estimate that I would advise using for a planet search. So, yep, absolutely. So if you use a better estimate, those numbers would increase by at least a factor of three. Yeah. So anyway, that was the next thing I was going to say, but that's fine. If everyone heard that, this is probably over-conservative. But what we really want to do is to wait until the Kepler mission is over and they've got the complete data set. And it's really important, again, because of these kinds of issues, uh, to be able to do a statistical search in the, um, you know, with, with uh, maximum sensitivity in the habitable zone, which is really microlensing. So, mass is an essential parameter. I argued that this morning in addition to radius. Uh, strategy should not be designed around direct detection, spectrometry, photometry only. Uh, if we didn't know the masses of the planets in our solar system, we went to study them, uh, or, the, or the moons, uh, we'd really be out you know, at sea. There'd be a lot we wouldn't know. Now, you know, someone came up to me afterwards and said, well, we're not going to know the radius of, of these objects. Uh, either. We have this albedo radius uh, ambiguity. And you know, one game that you could perhaps play is if you do get the masses for these objects, uh, you could, uh, if you've got good mass radius relationships, particularly for things that are close to the mass of the Earth, use that to determine the radius and then from the radius get the albedo. And then once you've taken a spectrum of this object with TPF, see if that spectrum uh, and the, the compounds that are present are consistent with that albedo. So there is a kind of a consistency uh, feedback loop that you could do with the masses even if you can't immediately resolve the albedo radius ambiguity. Um, radio velocity may be the primary technique for finding uh, masses of Earth-like bodies in nearby systems. Uh, obviously, the, uh, we're talking now about 10 centimeters per second or below. One thing that I am worried about is that because the number of systems will be small, the kind of statistical arguments that are used to say that there's a good chance that M sine I and M will be within a factor of two of each other really can't be used. We're probably going to be talking about a handful of objects. And if you have only a handful of objects, you really are not going to know until you launch TPF, I suppose, and track the orbit that way, whether the system's face on or edge on or part way in between. So um, this is something that's somewhat of concern. Uh, and again, it's unclear right now whether Earth mass bodies are sufficiently common for the less ambitious terrestrial planet finder, the coronagraphic telescope, to apply. Uh, probably we'll need space-based microlensing to sort this out. And right now, I have to say that um, being involved somewhat on the US side of this, um, the, the, the dialogue between NASA and ESA on the subject of collaborating between Euclid and W first is not going terribly well. Um, most of the reason for that is the uncertainty on the U.S. side more than anything else. On the other hand, one of the reasons that we have such a huge uncertainty uh, is that James Webb Space Telescope is way over budget and is going to be launched very late and that's a joint NASA-ESA mission. So, I think with regard to those two agencies, they're really in it together. And it behooves both agencies to, to try to work something out that's going to make some sense and get us a mission uh, that is some combination of Euclid and uh, W first that will do both the dark energy and the microlensing. And I have full confidence that will happen. 
So let me close my lectures by talking about uh, James Webb Space Telescope and what it might be able to do in the near term. That's the M-dwarf part of the strategy. Um, and then I'll move from the, the realm um, uh, within the M-dwarf planetary systems where JWST is going to be relevant uh, to the 1AU region around M-dwarfs and finish with Titan-like objects. So uh, here's James Webb Space Telescope uh, in space uh, at the L2 point. There's the moon, there's the earth, there's the sun. Uh, here is a model of it on uh, the lawn at Goddard. Uh, these people are actual size, they're not midgets. And so you can see that this is a very big telescope. Okay, the primary mirror is six and a half meters in diameter. It's a multiple mirror system. Uh, the, the mirror and the secondary here are fixed to a back plane which contains uh, optics and cooling systems. The instruments are in the back plane uh, as well and down below it and then underneath the sun shield is the spacecraft uh, and uh, all the maneuvering systems. The sun shield itself which is about the size of a standard tennis court uh, unfurls perfectly in space without malfunction to block the light of the sun and prevent the uh, optical system uh, from uh, getting uh, infrared radiation from the sun uh, as well as stray light from the sun. So various parts of this telescope will be cooled uh, down to quite low temperatures, 20, 10 Kelvin, depending on, on, on the, the, the portions of the telescope system. It's very complicated thermally. It's complicated electronically, physically, in terms of deployment. Uh, it's just complicated. Okay. Um, it's a joint NASA, ESA, Canadian Space Agency mission. Uh, NASA has primary responsibility for the spacecraft and the telescope. Uh, ESA is building uh, one and a half uh, instruments and will launch the spacecraft. It's purchased uh, an Ariane uh, 5, 4, 5 for that purpose. Thank you. Um, and uh, then the Canadian Space Agency has built um, one of the other instruments and then their US providers for the other one and a half. So there are four instruments. There's uh, near spec, the near infrared spectrometer, uh, which is uh, shown here in testing at uh, Astrium. This is also a full size person, so you can see it's very big. Uh, there's near cam, near infrared camera system. There's MIRI, a mid infrared imager and spectrometer. And then um, in the fine guidance sensor, there are tunable filters that are considered to be a separate instrument. They were once part of NIRCAM, but they were broken uh, off uh, because Canada uh, kindly agreed to take on more share of the work, CSA did, to save money in the US. So um, the near infrared instruments work from 0.6 to 5 microns, and the mid infrared instrument works from 5 microns to 28 microns. Uh, so with this size mirror and this amount of cooling and this wavelength range, uh, this is clearly uh, going by orders of magnitude beyond what has been done before in terms of sensitivity over the near to mid infrared wavelength range. And there's a wide variety of things that uh, James Webb can do. Um, I guess, do we get uh, alcohol at the banquet? <laughs> you don't know. Okay, so after some wine we can talk about the problems that James Webb is having, but we're not going to talk about them now. So. And full disclosure, I'm, I'm an IDS interdisciplinary scientist on James Webb. You, you can't cancel this telescope because the, the US space astronomy program will implode. Uh, infrared uh, astronomers will lose out on a key space-based system. You really can't do this from the ground. Uh, we really just have to you know, sort of struggle through this and get this thing launched. Uh, as difficult as it is, has been. But once it is launched, uh, it will be really a spectacular um, uh, new step in infrared astronomy. And in addition to all the cosmology it will do uh, and the solar system work, it'll do some great work on extrasolar planets. So here's some imaging modes for exoplanet uh, studies. Um, these are, uh, here's NIRCAM uh, and tunable filters in MIRI. This is imaging and then this is spectroscopy. Uh, so we have uh, coronagraphic imaging uh, at the uh, near infrared wavelengths uh, and then in the mid infrared wavelengths as well. 
uh, using various coronagraphs. Uh, in uh, terms of spectra, um, we're talking here about typically 3,000 for the spectral resolution, lambda over delta lambda, which is quite good and is about a factor of uh, 50, between 20 and 50 higher spectral resolution than the baseline uh, science plan for terrestrial planet finder. So these are high resolution spectra uh, from both MIRI and from the near spec. There we go. Okay, so the real target for doing these spectra is not the Earth around a sun-like star, but an Earth around an M dwarf for two reasons. Earth-sized bodies are, are easier to see because the M dwarfs are smaller, but also the habitable zone is in at a tenth of an AU, and so these planets have an excellent chance uh, of being found by transit. Of course, you have to do that search before Webb is launched because you cannot waste uh, Webb's lifetime doing that kind of survey. So that has to be done from the ground where it is being done and also perhaps even a cheap mission in space, although no space missions are cheap. Um, but anyway, here's an opportunity to get the first spectrum of not quite an Earth-sized planet. As Jim said, uh, the optimism that one could do this with something the size of the Earth has pretty much gone away and what's being talked about now are objects that are perhaps twice the, the diameter of the Earth. You know, can I, my understanding is it doesn't actually help to have a bigger planet because the planet gets bigger, so the circumference of the planet is bigger, but the scale height of the atmosphere gets smaller. Okay. Well, that's one argument, but that, I don't think that argument's correct because, you know, it, it, it basically assumes exactly Earth-like conditions. If, for example, you had a cloud-free atmosphere and liquid water underneath, um, you would benefit directly from the larger area of that body. So. There is one person involved in James Webb who is a real skeptic and has come up with all these arguments, but he's kind of two sigma over on the conservative side. There are a couple of others who are really optimistic, and then I'll show you the kind of middle, middle ground. So, yeah, I've heard that argument, but, you know, the, yes, you do benefit, I think, except in the case where you demand exactly an Earth-like atmosphere. Okay, so what can you see? Um, First of all, remember that spectra can be taken both uh, during the primary transit or primary eclipse when the planet is passing in front of the star and so you get a transmission spectrum and the secondary eclipse when the planet is about to pass behind the star. This is much more difficult, but here what you're getting is a measurement first while the planet is just out in front of the star, displaced from the star, so that you're seeing the full phase of the lit disk of this planet. And then as it passes uh, behind the star, you get the spectrum just of the star itself. Uh, you subtract those two spectra, star plus planet, from star, and you get the planet spectrum. Uh, both of these have been done for giant planets from, from Hubble and large ground-based telescopes. Uh, and this, of course, is a reflection spectrum. Okay, so this is from the optimism, the, the optimistic days, the Camelot days of this type of observation. This was Jeff Valenti and colleagues in 2007 showing a simulated JWST transit of an Earth-sized ocean-covered world. This is ratio in and out of transit, so this was a secondary transit versus wavelength, so this is for near spec. Uh, this assumed observing over 10 transits, getting 28 hours of observing time around a, an M3 dwarf, so an early M dwarf, uh, with a period of 29 days. And um, the sort of low resolution version of this is, is the one to kind of pay attention to. Um, you see the bands of H2O, of CO2 as well, so you know that water was present in CO2. You would not be able to see methane, obviously, in this situation if it had the, the mixing ratio that it has on Earth. Um, the, now we're beyond the days of Camelot, so these, this is sort of more the reality. Um, these are simulated spectra by Drake Deming and colleagues uh, for near spec from 1.8 to 3 microns for two objects that are both super Earths at a radius, each one has a radius about twice the radius of the Earth. The upper panel is for a really hot object with a surface temperature of 500 Kelvin, a distance of 32 parsecs away, and 
because this thing is really bright, um, you get a really good signal and the water bands show up very, very nicely. Um, the spectral resolving power here is R equals 100. If you want R equals 3000, of course, it's not going to look quite as good. The bottom one is for an object that has a surface temperature of 300 Kelvin uh, and uh, again is a super earth, twice the radius of the earth. Um, this is a 20 parsec distance. I can't remember why Drake had such odd numbers, but it's probably whatever he had in his simulations that he could dig out for this paper. Um, and you can, you can see that if you do enough binning, you can see the water bands, but it's a lot noisier. It's a lot noisier. Now, um, you know, this is, I regard this as state of the art, and I regard these as reasonable simulations. So it's a difficult observation but you will get some information. Jim? I think this is secondary transit or yeah. that you're talking about. That's right. Prim primary would be independent of the size of the planet, but secondary, right. the size will help you. Yes, the size will help you there. Yeah. That's right. Yep. Okay. So, um, good point. Okay. Now, you know, if you, uh, you could imagine all sorts of interesting things. If you could do both the primary and secondary transit, you might explore these eyeball earth uh, simulations like what Ray Pierre Humbert did where the near side uh, which you see in the secondary transit actually has a clear atmosphere and you see all the way to the surface and you know maybe you'd see the the liquid water ocean or maybe there would be just a 10 micron silicate feature there and then the primary transit would be probing uh, these parts of the atmosphere in transmission where you had significant amounts of cloud uh, and uh, perhaps you would actually uh, be able to, to uh, look at the difference between these two and actually detect a difference between the primary and the secondary transit that might lead you to conclude that it's uh, some sort of uh, eyeball earth. Uh, I've shown the temperature profiles already. So if you don't like eyeball earth, let's put a big X in front of them. Uh, and in fact, let's zap them with coronal mass ejections and, and stellar flares and and tidal locking and, and high impact rates and all that sort of thing. But since we're in an M dwarf system, let's remind ourselves again that um, out at 1 AU from such an object, from such a cool star, uh, if there's an Earth-sized planet there, it's not going to have an effective temperature of 260 Kelvin. It'll have an effective temperature of 85 Kelvin. Uh, now, of course, this exact distance depends on the particular M dwarf we're talking about, but the general point is that the 1AU planet in that system is going to most resemble, if it has methane, Titan. Um, now specific distances, this is from a paper by um, Gilliam and McKay. I actually, I first wrote about this for um, a conference by the American Philosophical Society uh, in 2008 and uh, I sent Chris a copy of this paper and uh, he sort of jumped on this and had a, a, a student working with him, which is great. Uh, so this is distance from the star in AU versus the fraction of haze relative to the amount of haze that's in Titan today. And so this is the, um, the distance that an object would have to have to, to have the effective temperature of Titan given this haze for two stars, one Gliese 581 and then a much cooler M, uh, M4 uh, dwarf star. So these are, these are both M dwarfs, but one is hotter than the other. So um, again, you know, we're talking about between a few tenths of an AU for the coolest case and uh, about an AU. Now, leaving aside the fact that the chance of an object at one AU transiting its parent star is exceedingly small, so you would have to be able to get observations a different way, what would you see in such an object? Well, obviously, it would be dominated by the methane bands. So this is um, a simulation of Titan's atmosphere by Cialetti et al. And she's a, a, a PhD student at, um, in, in Rome. And we're working to um, convert her Titan model into a Titan around a red dwarf model to try to look at how the spectra change. Uh, and uh, Simone Yeva is another student who's working with me on this, too. So the spectrum to really concentrate on is the blue one, which is a VIM spectrum of Titan. And in the 1 to 5 micron region, it's really dominated by methane. And so um, if you were to 
obtain a spectrum of an object like this. And actually for the coolest M dwarfs, because the appropriate orbital distance is 0.2 or 0.3 AU, you have some marginal chance of having one of these be a transiting object. Um, you would see a spectrum that's really dominated by methane and, and it would tell you that this was a Titan-like object. There are going to be all sorts of interesting differences between um, our, our Titan in our solar system and Titans around M dwarfs. I'll just point out a couple of these. Here's that temperature profile for Titan's atmosphere that I showed yesterday, pressure versus temperature in degrees Kelvin. And remember that Titan has this very dramatic stratospheric temperature rise due to absorption of solar radiation in the blue part of the spectrum. The temperature rises from 70 Kelvin at the tropopause to uh, over 170 Kelvin uh, at, uh, at and near the, the mesopause. And you know, this is, these are very warm temperatures, so the proportional temperature rise on Titan is much larger than it is for the Earth, for the Earth's stratosphere. But if you put Titan around an, an M dwarf, there's not going to be much solar radiation in the blue. And so most of the radiation is going to be in the red where these very tiny haze particles don't actually ab uh, absorb very well. Um, there will be UV, but there won't be as much UV as in the case of the sun. And the bottom line is you could have a Titan where there is no such stratosphere like this, where you have a relatively cold stratosphere, where photochemistry is sluggish and that's going to reduce the amount of haze in this atmosphere dramatically. Plus, any object that you have a chance of even looking at is not going to be the physical size of our Titan. It's going to be the physical size of the Earth. That means that little g is larger, so the aerosols fall out more quickly. So in general, these objects will have a clearer atmosphere than our Titan does, which will make it easier to see to the surface. Uh, Gilliam and McKay also looked, uh, began looking at this, although they didn't do this in a lot of detail. Um, this is the black body spectrum for uh, one of their two M stars. Uh, this is flux uh, emitted through Titan's atmosphere versus wavelength. So the atmosphere is transparent where the values are high. And what you can see is that this M dwarf uh, has a peak in its black body function and its emitted radiation right where there is an enormous opacity in Titan's atmosphere uh, with a couple of windows, with one little window here and, and some wings on the side. So again, everything's going to be different in terms of how this object is absorbing solar radiation, what the haze is like, and so on. And one can you know, make interesting speculations as to how that's going to affect um, the surface conditions on this object. Also, the geothermal heating is going to be much larger on an Earth-sized Titan than it is on our Titan uh, because there's much more rock and the surface area to volume ratio is smaller. So there's going to be a more significant contribution from um, radiogenic heating, from geothermal heating. It's going to be a more volcanic place, although that still won't dominate. I've done that calculation. So um, this is the methane habitable zone. And maybe it's completely sterile. Maybe life cannot exist in liquid methane or ethane but there's not a single person on the earth today who can tell you whether a form of organized chemistry can or can't exist in liquid methane. So sitting at, at one AU or a few tenths of an AU, this region uh, is more uh, resilient against flares and tidal locking than the 0.1 or 0.05 AU region than an earth condition object, a, a water hydrosphere would, would require. Um, and therefore, uh, because M dwarfs are the most common main sequence star in the universe, if we um, consider the possibility that an Earth at a tenth of an AU or 0.05 AU around an M dwarf uh, might have a hard time retaining a stable, bio, a stable hydrosphere, um, it's possible that methane hydrospheres, methane hydrologic cycles, uh, may in fact be vastly more common than water hydrologic cycles in the cosmos. I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's important to recognize that the M dwarf situation is a hundred times more common than the sun situation, the G dwarf situation, simply because of the difference in abundance of M dwarfs versus G dwarfs. M dwarfs are the most common main sequence star in the cosmos and the longest live stars. 
um, M dwarfs stay on the main sequence for longer than the age of the universe. So even though this won't help us in searching for life on Titan today, we could imagine that um, you know, life could take as long as it wants to try to develop in a methane-ethane medium. But again, an observable Titan would need to be the size of the Earth. Um, so, I'm not endorsing a shift in the program of searching for habitable extrasolar planets away from Earth to Titan. You know, we need to be able to focus on things we understand, but we also need to think about ways that we might be able to investigate planets that are simply different from what we think of as the habitable worlds that we want to look for around other stars. Um, there's a tendency as scientists, uh, with a few exceptions, to think in the box instead of out of the box. And we really need to think out of the box in terms of the range of possible planets that might exist around other stars and what habitability really means in a, in a fundamental sense. Uh, and that brings me back to where I started, which was the basic point that um, if you have free energy, uh, if you have a system uh, where it, you're receiving energy that's well away from equilibrium, and it's a complex organic system which also has the right inorganic components to make it work, uh, why can't you have complex organic chemistry? Um, the only way to find out is to explore. So, no matter which kind of habitable zone you prefer, um, I wish all of you a fruitful search for one. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few minutes for questions. Good, everyone's stunned. We can go get a drink. Yeah. With respect to your last case, um, would that then still be uh, trying to check the for an object like Titan or an envelope in transit? Or could you actually go and image them directly? What is the contrast there, Stuart? Um, okay, so uh, in the case of a Titan around an M dwarf um, at 85 Kelvin, uh, if this were a really, really late M dwarf, so that you had to be in at a few tenths of an astronomical unit, you might hope that there would be some of these transiting, and so you do this in transit, basically. Um, but for an early M dwarf, the um, Titan region, the methane habitable zone, is at one astronomical unit. There's probably almost no chance that we'll find a transiting, you know, a system that's so well aligned that we're going to see transits. So that you'd have to do by direct detection. Uh, the contrast ratio uh, between um, an M dwarf and a Titan, it, you basically take by scaling the case for the Sun and, um, and the Earth. Um, I'm trying to remember now what the, the con what this, how you scale down a, a G dwarf uh, versus an M dwarf. I guess it's a factor of two or three orders of magnitude, is that right, in brightness? Um, but then you lose a factor of 10 because Titan is um, itself a, a dimmer and darker object than the Earth. So you'd probably buy uh, one or two orders of magnitude in contrast ratio, which still, for the Earth around the Sun, is nine orders of magnitude. So you're still seven orders of magnitude down. So it's still a very difficult task. And I'm assuming a Titan that has the, the size of the Earth, the disk the size of the Earth. Yeah. What are the range of physical conditions that, that can exist and still maintain a Titan type world, like temperature, and um, Well, the, the critical point for methane is 190 Kelvin, just as the critical point for water is 620 Kelvin. So if you get a situation, okay, now let's imagine again, not our Titan, which is so small that if you start heating things up, the loss rates are going to go way up. If you just think of an Earth-sized Titan, you just basically um, want to have conditions that allow you to have methane at the surface below 190 Kelvin, uh, which is the critical point. Obviously, uh, you know, the amount of methane that you would have, um, what would happen if you're considering a body where there's very little water ice, but it's actually rock and methane. I mean, nobody's really worked that out. At, at some level, when you start to unpack Titan in this way and make it more Earth-like, you might actually end up driving the system more toward a kind of a primitive Earth, which has a lot of methane, but also has CO2 and, and you know, perhaps water and so on. 
so there's got to be a transition between these. Uh, I think the Virtual Planet Lab should try to make some of these at the at uh, you know Seattle. Okay, I'll suggest suggest so that to yeah, that's right. The reason right. I even asked that question is that I actually I'll dig it up. I think I may have it on my computer. Where I took every kind of organic salt that there was and sort of placed it into a sort of a temperature activity range. Mm -hmm. And to see where methane, ethane, et cetera, overlap with some of, for example, Steve Benner's favorite organic salt. Mm -hmm. And if it were possible that you could actually move in a direction that you could actually end up with some other solvents that are even more, even better for organic synthesis than, than ethane or methane, it's still in the, it's not that much a distance in terms of temperature conditions to do that. I'll try to right. do that up and yeah. show it tomorrow. Yeah, okay. no, I, I discussion. yeah, I think it would be interesting to look at the whole range of possible organic solvents, absolutely. Because some, you know, as I said, formamide, for example, which actually does over, I think overlaps with that thing. And, and that, mm -hmm. uh, it's really, it favors the so-called foremost reaction. Mm -hmm. And the foremost reaction is the reaction that, that we make a lot of the uh, organic intermediates in. Mm -hmm. It just seems to like that better than water. Mm. That's interesting. Yes. Um, can you get a runaway greenhouse for methane in the same way uh, as for water? And the second question is, how much do the end dwarfs walk, um, increase in brightness? So, like the sun increases in brightness over time. Okay, so I'll answer the second question and I'll let the runaway greenhouse expert in the room answer the first question about runaway greenhouses with methane. So, M dwarfs evolve very, very slowly. Basically, the, that early figure from casting it all that I showed yesterday with the, the different ages on them as the inner edge crept in. By the time you got to the M dwarfs, there was no difference. It was just a fixed habitable zone because they undergo hydrogen fusion so slowly that they basically last for 10 to the 11 years, so uh, typical M dwarfs. Faint, faint young M -dwarf there's no faint young M dwarf problem and there's no bright old M dwarf problem. <coughs> But they're not that stable. I mean, the you know, M dwarfs have a tendency to be more uh, flary, to produce more flares uh, and so on than G dwarfs do for reasons that aren't entirely well understood. So the, the kind of short-term stability is more problematic, but the long-term stability is, is quite good. Do you want to talk about the methane uh, think, runaway? Uh, titan, methane on Titan is exactly analogous to liquid water on Earth. So there should be a methane habitable zone, which should have an inner edge where you get a methane runaway greenhouse, and it should have an outer edge where you get the methane to freeze out. And uh, you know, I, it hasn't been calculated, but that's a doable calculation for someone. Yep. By the way, I have to advertise, this is, I actually was able to get a good photograph, which for me is an achievement, but that's actually close to the Mexican border uh, in Arizona and uh, about 15 miles south of where we live. So that's the San Rafael Valley in Arizona. It's not Spain, it's not California, it's not Africa. And the Just to let you know. Is it, is it uh, a that's fake one? Or a yeah, it's an artist concept of a hydrocarbon lake on yeah. Titan. Is it a photograph that was um, yeah, just uh, colored? Or I don't know. I have to. Uh, this was done by Randy Kirk at USGS, and I can give you his email address if you want to find out how he did it. I think it's it's actually it's quite nice, personally. I think it's quite quite impressively done. I'm not quite so sure about the sediments, those tilted sediments in the background, but um, be that as it may. Okay. If there are no other questions, um, we'll we'll break and see you all at the banquet. Thank you.